Hi folks, well it's time to talk about my Gen Con overview. What did I think of my trip at Gen Con 2016? Well, I'm going to let you know. First off, I'm going to give you my uh, top five list again and tell you, uh, just kind of check them all for you and tell you if they were a thumbs up, a thumbs to the side, or a thumbs down. I'm also going to talk about what I thought was the most overrated game, the five best games I played, and maybe some general uh, news that I got from Gen Con to share with you. So let's go ahead and let's jump into my top five most anticipated things at Gen Con. Did I complete them and were they good? Well, yeah, I completed all of them, of course. Uh, but number five was meeting YouTube celebrities. And uh, I did get to meet a few. I got to see uh, on the very first day Tom Vassell of the Dice Tower. Super nice guy. If one word could describe him, it'd be a gentleman. Uh, very friendly. Uh, there was tons of people in line to meet him. He made sure to take the time to talk to me. I didn't know what to talk about. I never do when I'm around him. But a uh, super nice guy. I also got to meet at the same Dice Tower booth, Chaz Marler from Pair of Dice Paradise. Now, if you haven't heard of Chaz, he is just a funny dude, man. And uh, I actually told him, I said, man, I love all your videos. And then I paused. I said, hey, you know what? I bet everyone tells you that. In fact, who would walk up to your face and say, I hate your videos? And without skipping a beat, he said, my family. <laughs> I mean, Chaz is just super witty, and that's what makes his channel so much fun and insightful, too. So uh, I really enjoyed doing that. Now, I don't have a picture of the next celebrity I met, but it was Rodney Smith from Watch It Played. Uh, I've watched Rodney Smith several times. I love him. He was very hard to find last year. I had to track him down. Uh, this year, he wasn't hard to find at all, man. He was at different tables, playing games, laughing with other people. I didn't want to interrupt the game for a picture, but I did shake his hand, say hello. I kind of sat around, watched a, watched a few minutes of a game. I can't remember what game they were playing. Uh, but man, he was just in the middle of it with talking just, you know, six strangers that probably knew him, but uh, he was great. Now, the one person that I really wanted to meet that I didn't get a chance to was Forrest Bauer from Bauer's Game Corner. Uh, folks, one of the very few channels I subscribe to is Forrest Bauer. I, I love his uh, comedy, uh, his insights, his reviews are good. I mean, he's a, he's a pretty good, solid guy on YouTube, and he covers Gen Con like no other channel does. Now, usually, I can always see him out on the exhibit hall. Like last year, I saw him everywhere, everywhere. I think I saw him every day, sometimes twice a day. This year, could not find him at all. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he did all his reviews before the doors opened. I don't know. I looked everywhere for that dude. I really wanted to say hello to him. Uh, talk about you know how much I appreciate his videos, maybe play a board game with him, maybe grab dinner or lunch. Didn't happen. Oh well, you know. Uh, so I'm gonna put on this list, number five, thumb to the side. Because even though I did get to meet a lot of great YouTube celebrities, the one I really wanted to meet, I could not find anywhere at Gen Con, and believe me, I looked. Now my number four on the list was meeting Dave Farland, or how Star Wars fans know him as Dave Wolverton. Uh, I did. I had him sign a bunch of my children's books. I had some Star Wars children's books, uh, Star Wars Episode One Adventures, and the Star Wars Missions books that he wrote. Uh, last year, I just got him to sign his big hardback and the Jedi Apprentice book that he wrote. Uh, and this year, I was like, well, if he's going to be there, I'm going to have him sign everything. Because you never know how authors are going to be when you give them a stack of books this tall of kitty books to sign. You know, they're going, oh boy. Um, uh, Dave Farland was super nice. Uh, got to talk to him for a, a long time. Again, made him late to another uh, engagement. He was speaking at a forum, and he didn't even know. They came in to get him. They said, uh, Mr. Farland, you're supposed to be in this room, like, now. <laughs> He's like, oh, okay. And the man's not rattled. You go into his... Uh, he was just sitting in a room by himself on his computer working. It's almost like if you walked in on Gandalf or Dumbledore, you know, in their office. It's very serene around the man. He's very calm. He has a calming manner. Uh, very nice guy. Uh, talked about how uh, the Scholastic books, I was, you know, he was signing the Scholastic books, so he told stories about Scholastic. And he said that when he wrote those Episode 1 adventures, that the uh, chief editor called him and said, this is the best stuff we have ever put out. And they were putting it out for a game. If you recall, the, those Star Wars Episode One's adventures was basically it was a game you play with dice. It was kind of role playing, kind of like a board game. There wasn't really a board, I don't think, but you had to roll and move. It's almost like an RPG. 
for kids. And uh, it came accompanied with a little paperback book if you wanted to read the story. If you didn't, you just played out the adventure as it went along. But they said, you know, this wasn't supposed to be that big a deal and that his story and that adventure was some of the best stuff they'd ever had. So that was a big compliment. In fact, he said his editor, uh, Force Classic, never changed anything in his book, just the title. And uh, most of the titles that he had are not on those books. Uh, some are. I can't remember which one he said. Anakin and the Ghost Children, I think, was his one. I don't remember which, uh, which the other one was. But that was all the editor would do was just change the title because there was nothing to change in the script because it was pretty good. Uh, so that was really funny. He talked about keeping those children's books that were in a game in continuity, making sure it was in continuity with the rest of the universe because, hey, it's Star Wars. It has to stay in one continuity, which proves my point when I talk about Star Wars books to other people and explain what the expanded universe was. But anyway... Uh, so a thumbs up on this on the list. Uh, it was definitely worth my time. Uh, Dave Farland or Wolverton, uh, if you ever get a chance to meet him, even if you don't know what he's written, just go talk to him. The man is super smart, especially when it comes to the world of publishing. He can give you a lot of his thoughts on you know how younger authors should act and what they should do differently from others. Just a great guy. Number three was a board game that I wanted to play. I went to test play it, paid my two bucks to sit down and learn the game. I was going to do it last year, but it was all booked up because it was the, one of the hot games. All right, this year, not one of the hot games. There's tons of other games out there. And so I finally was able to get a ticket and sit down and play The King's Armory by Gatekeeper uh, Games. Uh, the King's Armory is a tower defense game. Uh, looks really cool, has really nice pieces attached to it, especially if you get the deluxe version. You get those pewter pieces. And so I'd seen this last year at uh, Gen Con. I wanted it. I wanted to drop the hundred plus dollars on it right then and there because the die looked nice. Everything looks, the art looks nice. And so I was like, okay, I'm, I'm ready to do this. But first, I want to play this game. Now, I never got to test play it. So I said, well, I'll wait till next year. Next year came around. I got my ticket. I was super excited. I got there at five o'clock when it was supposed to start. And at 5.05, no one was there. And I started thinking, am I in the right spot? Of course I was, that we found other people waiting at the same table. We're waiting for the same thing. But they were asking themselves the same question. Where was the guy to show up and show us this game? So uh, about 5.10, I went and talked to one of the Gen Con reps. And they told me that if they weren't there in 15 minutes, we could get our money back. And that would be that. But at that same time, the uh, designer of the game showed up apologized to us, said that uh, the guy that had been hired to do the run-through uh, didn't show up, and he was shorthanded, and you know he's shorthanded at his booth, and so he's coming out here, he's going to set up the game and show us it, but then he's got to run to his booth real quick and close at closing time, and then he'll be right back to finish the game with us. Uh, there were some other people there who had bought the game, and they were wanting to know what they were doing wrong with the game, because they said the game took 10 hours to play. They said it was a super long game. And the designer said, no, you're playing it wrong. It's not a long game. Just come to the you know, playthrough. We'll show you what you're doing wrong. And so they were just there you know, as spectators. And there were six of us around the board, and I think four in another group. Now, I can't speak for the other group because I, I don't know what their impression was. But uh, he set it up for us and explained the rules and then said, man, I'm really thirsty. i got to get some water. But then someone volunteered to go get some water for him. He said, okay, well, I really need to go to the restroom. We're like, hey, man, go to the restroom, you know. I mean, we understand, right? He's crushed. He's under time. So he goes to the restroom. He comes back out. He tells us the rest of the rules, answers any of our questions. But then it's time to close his booth. So then he leaves us and says he'll be right back. So for the next 30 to 45 minutes, we sat there trying to figure out how to play this game, even though we had been told the rules. Now, to be honest, folks, I I I'm not that smart when it comes to reading directions and following rules in games, okay? I've I've, I've done some, you know, uh, misread some of the information, misplayed some of the rules before. Uh, it happens. It happens. I will, I'm someone who will read the instructions and get it totally wrong sometimes. And we'll have to reread and decide, what does this mean? So I know what I'm like. But there were six other, I mean, five of the people in my group, and none of them knew what to do. Well, they had the rule book out. They were talking. Well, didn't he say this? Well, yeah, but I thought it meant that. I don't understand. How do you... Like, how do you bring uh, bad guys out? You know, the waves. How's that work? Uh, very confusing chart. Very confusing. Uh, how do they move? What do they do? How do you tank? Do you fight them right there? When's our turn? What can we do? 
And the game had gone on to about six. It was six o'clock now. So it had gone on for almost an hour. And we'd maybe gotten two of the first wave out. So yeah, it looked like it was going to take 10 hours to play. So the spectators who were watching were not getting anything out of it. And they're going, yeah, this is the same problem we had. And then they just walked off. Well, then the rest of us were just getting frustrated because the rules were just so confusing. The rule book just wasn't clear to us. I mean, I, I just wasn't clear. I mean, if there's six people and you're not clear to us, I don't know what's going on. So it got to where a few of us started checking our phones, a few of us started looking around, and then suddenly, one by one, we dropped and just walked. Uh, I think I walked after the second person. So I know there are three that walked away. I don't. I can't speak for anyone else because I, I was gone by then. But uh, it was a terrible experience. It was a terrible game. I'm glad I did not spend the money. I will not buy that game. Um, and I will not encourage others to do so. Now, let me go back to the designer. I think he's a great guy. I think he's a nice guy. And yeah, he was obviously in a bind, right? Shorthanded. He was trying to do his best. So it's not his fault necessarily. But man, are, do you need all of your helpers at the you know, closing with you? Do you really need all of them? Shouldn't you have just sent one person to maybe help clarify rules for us? I mean, there was no one left there. I mean, unless he was the only person, which I doubt he would have left his booth all, all alone by himself. So there had to be at least one other person. And I know you're in a bunch, man, but it, it definitely hurt uh, the impression of the game to at least three people. And uh, the other people were just kept reading the rules, and they were scratching their heads. They didn't know what to do. I don't think that was a win-win. So I'm going to say thumbs down on that. Uh, King's Armory it looks pretty. Looks pretty, but looks, looks aren't everything, right? That was my important lesson there. So number four on the list is a, I mean, number three on the list is a dud. All right, so my number two uh, on my list was I was looking forward to the trip itself, right? I wanted to know if the trip was going to be super fun because last year I went by myself. I uh, had an all right time, you know, I mean, by yourself, you can only do so much and the trip up there is so boring. But thankfully, I had two other people coming with me, uh, Dylan and Jeremy, some uh, friends that I met over YouTube, uh, flew in, uh, came to see me, and drove the 12 hours with me. And I'll be honest, we had a super time. First off, the drive, 12 hours, it looks, it sounds like a lot, it is a lot, but it didn't feel like a lot. Because we were talking, we were laughing, we were talking about it, and time just flew by, and it was wonderful. I'm so thankful for them, because if they hadn't have gone, it turns out I would have been driving by myself again, staying by myself again, and doing stuff on my own again, which I did not want to do, and I definitely would have been uh, ticked off if that would have happened. So I'm glad that they got to go, and we, ha we did a lot of stuff. We played a lot of games. Um, Jeremy has showed so much energy while every every evening when we played these games too I mean he was just out there he was like a party animal every day starting at like three or four in the afternoon um, and those are the only pictures that I had I could have taken pictures all throughout the day and I should have uh, but you know I, he, he eventually woke up here and there uh, but he likes to sleep especially in the hallways at Gen Con I'll leave it to him to tell you that story but, uh, you know, uh, I really appreciate having them there. We really had a great time. So the trip is a thumbs up on my list. Now, number one on my list uh, last year and this year was getting to visit the board game library. And as I told a lot of you on my channel, I plan to go there every night and all day on Saturday, since Saturday is kind of crazy out in the exhibit hall. And so we did exactly that. And I had a blasty blast out there. I mean, there was so much more in the Gen Con library this year than there was last year. We're talking older games, out of print games, uh, it did everything you could think of. Even some of the new, newer games that were coming out, you know, they had, you know, copies uh, for you to uh, rent out in the board game library. It was incredible. It was amazing. I love that place. Uh, we got to sit down and play Twilight Imperium 3. Um, and that was super fun. That was my own copy that I brought, and we sat there and played it, and we beat it in a record five hours. Yeah, <laughs> only took us five hours, uh, which my previous record was six. So five hours. Don't they? They were new, and they really didn't. They were still getting to understand the rules, 
and I just wanted the game to end, so I was huffing for those points because I didn't want to stay there and make a 10-hour game of it, even though I think uh, some of my friends would have done it again and they would have wanted a 15-hour game. They really enjoyed it, and I'm really happy because it's one of my favorite games. But uh, we played several games, and I'll get to that when I get to my top five games because some of the games we play in the board game library are also in my top five. Uh, but a few other things I want to talk about. I did get to uh, see a friend of the channel here, uh, Spencer. I got to meet him. He actually approached me. He said, hey, you're Matt Wilkins, right? Yeah, I watch your YouTube videos. And that was really cool. And he's a really awesome guy. Uh, we both share the same loves of Star Wars books and board games. And uh, that, to me, is just amazing. I mean, he's, he's one of those guys, I'm like, yeah, I could see you being part of my game group, like, right now. So, you know, if he wants to move down to Louisiana, he, he's got a friend. Um, he's got a nice uh, uh, Star Wars collection, too. But, uh, yeah, that, that was really cool. And I know there was a, a few of you that uh, were emailing me, and I didn't check my email while I was there. I'm, I'm an idiot. That's, that's totally on me. And you were saying, hey, Madam at Gen Con, where are you? And I was in the board game library having fun. Uh, and so I, I am, I'm a little upset that I got to miss some of you. You made the effort to reach out to me, and I should have been checking my email. So for that, I apologize. Uh, but uh, anyway, the board game library was super duper fun. Uh, we played tons of games, like I said, and this is a time I want to talk about the event staff at Gen Con. I want to give them kudos. Uh, Gen Con is a great con for many reasons. I visit several comic cons all over the nation, okay? I am the comic con guy. I'll tell you what separates Gen Con from 90% of uh, comic cons. Gen Con has a knowledgeable and friendly staff. And that goes a long way. There are not that many cons out there who can say the same. And both knowledgeable and friendliness uh, together. We had one girl. I do not know her name because her card only said K and then it had her last name on it. Uh, so Miss K is what we'll call her. Super nice. Came by our table every night. Asked us how we were doing. What did we do today? What games did we play? What you got here? Oh, this is fun. This is one of my favorite games. It was like always one of her favorite games. Uh, and I'm sure it was. Uh, she said, you know what, guys? Tomorrow, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to play a game with you. And so tomorrow, that next night, sure enough, true to her word, she sat down and showed us Galaxy Trucker. Um, not my type of game. But, but it, uh, my friends enjoyed it. So... It was fun for that reason. She made it fun. Uh, she was wonderful. In fact, the entire event staff, in my opinion, did a fantastic job. I was really happy with them. So, you know, what's the board game library get on my list? It gets a thumbs, a strong thumbs up, maybe two. Uh, so that is my list there for Gen Con. And now let's move on to the news. First off, Zombies from Twilight Creations. I got to see their you know, big collector's box. It's a huge wooden box with the word Zombies on it that carries all of your expansions. Should you get this box? I'm going to say no. Um, I don't know how much it costs. It doesn't look that impressive. It looks like someone made it off Etsy and you bought it or you did your own arts and crafts and made it yourself. It doesn't look that unique. It doesn't look like it'll hold any extra zombies because you know if you're using all the uh, expansions, you're going to need extra zombies, or at least I do when I play Zombiegeddon. Of course, that might not could be the purpose of it, right? It could be <clears throat> zombies and then one expansion. I don't know, but it doesn't look like it would hold that many zombies. But um, uh, it also is bulky. I, I don't know why you would put it on your shelf. It, it, does, it eliminates a lot of boxes, but the box itself that you put it in cannot fit on one of those boxes. So for that reason, storage capacity, no good. Um, so I wasn't impressed. That was just me. Also, I asked them about Zombies 15, and here's what I learned. Uh, it is going to happen in the desert. I don't know how I feel about that. I'm sure they have an idea of what they're going through. A desert is a little weird. I'm not judging. I want to see it before I judge it. And then they said when it was coming out, 2017, just like I predicted. I knew that game was going to get delayed from day one. Uh, this will be the first time that Twilight Christians hasn't put out anything in a year. 
Um, like I said, uh, since the death of their owner, the, his wife took over. Carrie seems really nice and everything, and I, I like talking to her. But at the same time, it's obvious uh, that uh, her husband was the guy who basically ran the show and ran a tight ship. And, and you know, there could be a lot of other personal reasons. I don't know. Uh, they, they seem to be a very nice family, and I love the game. I mean, heck, it's one of my gateway games. They don't owe me anything. They don't have to put out a game every year like they've been doing. Heck, they've been doing that for 14 years, and I wish they were only doing it for 13 of those. Uh, but the expansions are good as they are. If they don't make any more, I'm fine. Uh, there's going to be more delays, folks. So, Zombies uh, 15 will be coming out next year. I'll be getting it. Will it be good? I don't know. It may be my last one if it's no good. And like I said, I wasn't impressed with 14, so if 15's the same, I may be stepping away and loving what I have. Because who says every expansion has to be good, right? Who can claim that every expansion is super good? Really no board game, especially a board game that's gone this long. You're going to have some duds there along the way. But it looks like the creativity is gone. Uh, maybe the passion's gone too. Of course, that's just speculation. I could be wrong. Um, and I, I do love this game, but... It was disheartening to hear that. No mention of Martians 2, which is something they were advertising years ago, and then they keep hyping up every year, but it's never going to make. So it doesn't look like they're getting anything started. Now, they are bought out, bought out by Mayfair Games, so Mayfair may pick up the pieces and you know literally pick them up and move and keep producing bigger, better games from them, but who knows? Who knows what's going to happen with that? On the flip side... I did talk to the CEO of Gale Force 9, and I talked to him about Firefly. Now, what he told me, he has not told any other interviewer, and I am sworn to secrecy, so I cannot talk about what he has upcoming for Firefly. All I can say is it's, there's going to be a game. It's going to be separate on its own. However... If you wanted to, it's definitely compatible with the base Firefly game and all the expansions. How? I can't say. He told me what it was going to be. And it, it sounds amazing. It sounds incredible. And how, he's, how they're doing it is honestly, honestly, it's super smart. And I am super excited to see what's going to become of it because you're going to have something. Gale Force 9, they've been the pioneer in taking TV shows and making great board games out of it, in my opinion. And the idea that John has coming up for Firefly to make a game that's a standalone game but can definitely be integrated easily with no effort at all into the base game is so smart and it it's going to be good it's going to be a big box game it's going to be fantastic i can't wait to talk about it but i have to let gale force 9 say the announcement before i can vomit out all the information i know uh john was a great guy i appreciate him talking to me about it i i did beg and plead and uh swear myself to secrecy so but folks firefly is a great game you've seen me review it before it's one of my favorite games uh, if you don't own it, you probably should. Uh, but if you don't, if you don't even own it, you're thinking, "Well, I'll wait." Okay, we'll wait for this new game, and then you'll be like, "Okay, I need to get out of the game and combine these. This is going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome." But that's all I can say about that. Okay, folks, now it's time to talk about my most overrated game at Gen Con. There's a lot of big board games that came out this year that got tons of big hype, and there was one of them that got just huge hype. I got to play it, and it was definitely the most overhyped game at Gen Con. It sold out, too, sadly. There's going to be a thousands of sad people playing this game, in my opinion, when they realize it's not that fun. And to me, it was Last Friday. Folks, I played Last Friday. You are uh, campers running away from a maniac. One person plays as the maniac, <clears throat> and it is basically... The Friday the 13th version of Letters to White Chapel. Yep, that's all they did. They changed up a few mechanics. Uh, this game was, let me think of the word, garbage. Uh, it was no fun. We played two different scenarios. 
Uh, the maniac was only able to kill one person, and that's because that person was really stupid and ran right into the maniac. Now you can the game lets you allows you to see the maniacs move three moves ago. You know where were they three moves ago, and therefore you have a broken game right there because you know how how much the maniac can move. The maniac gets no special powers, so the maniac is always going to move x amount of spaces. So if you know where he is, you can draw out in your head all the scenarios of where he would be. And that section's all, it's a small section of the board of where he can be. So you know what parts to avoid every time. It's just space counting. Once you see where the maniac is and you know he has three more moves, he can only move three spaces. You count out all three spaces in a circumference and there you go. You know where the maniac is. No camper should ever die in that game. You should always be able to beat, beat the maniac. Sure, you may have to go a different way, have to go a long way to avoid him. You can move faster than the maniac. Uh, you can ha you have special abilities. The maniac doesn't. So there's a billion ways to get away from the maniac. Like I said, two scenarios. One person died. The guy was thinking, "Huh? Well, usually most people a lot. We have a lot more campers died than this. Y'all did pretty good that round. Yeah, because the game's broken, and we know we know what's going to happen. And then some of the spaces on the board are completely irrelevant." Like there's no reason a camper would walk to the outer edges of that board. Zero. Unless there's one scenario in the game where they have to make it to the four edges. I don't know. Why would you run out in the woods? So just like the Friday the 13th movies, you have to be an idiot to die in this game. All right? You have to be an idiot and not know what's going on. It's an easy game to play. It is totally worthless. It was totally overhyped. Do not get this game. If you did... Hurry up, sell it on eBay or Board Game Geek. You know, no one will know. Uh, but that game to me, eh, you know, no good. All right, so let me talk about my top five games at Gen Con. All right, now, this, this is the part where you can make fun of me, right? Since I made fun of last Friday, it may be your favorite game. Uh, but these were the five games I played. Uh, I'll give you a little caveat. Two of them are out of print. Um, but I played them in the board game library. I love them. So uh, I'm going to talk about, I'm, I've included those as well. And number five was a game called Lift It. Uh, Lift It is a game where you're wearing a headband, you have a construction crane on your forehead, it has a line and a hook, and you're trying to hook these little obstacles, you know, with your head and move them to the center of the play mat and build a structure from the card presented. Now there are several cards in the deck. If you complete it, you move forward a few spaces. Uh, my favorite parts are when you have to duel someone else, and it's a race to the finish. Uh, this was a really fun game. Now, I don't know how long it would stay fun you know, for someone who bought it, but I can imagine hours of fun and laughter trying to put it together. And Some people were getting ticked off about it. Uh, my buddy who played it with me was getting in the ticked off stage. I just started laughing. I thought it was incredibly fun, incredibly smart. Uh, the one thing I'd have to say if I, if I had to complain about it, the time limit they give you, way too short. I mean, maybe I, we tried to double the time limit after a while when none of us were getting anywhere close. Maybe we just sucked at the game. I don't know. But we doubled the time limit. We still could hardly finish those, uh, the uh, builds on the picture card. So, I mean, maybe it's just a super hard game. Maybe I'm just an idiot playing it. But I had a lot of fun playing it. I was seesawing about buying it, but I sighed against it since, yeah, it would probably aggravate a lot of people, especially if someone was really good at it and someone wasn't. That wouldn't be a good gateway game for anyone. So it didn't make my list of buy stuff. But that was number five. Number four is one of the two out-of-print games I have on this list that I played. Uh, me and my buddies rented this game as a joke. We laughed the entire time as we brought out the box. We laughed when we read the rules. Uh, we laughed when we looked at the pieces. We laughed during the setup. And then we played it, and we're laughing for a different reason. We loved this game. And I'll be honest, it's out of print, but if they brought it back into print in 2017, it would make Gen Con great again. Folks, it is the Trump board game. That's right, Trump. Uh, if you haven't played this game... 
I can't describe how much fun it is. I, I don't even know, you know, why it's that fun, but it is. And I had a great time playing it. Maybe a little too much fun. But we just laughed and cackled, and I'll be honest, if I see it in a flea market or a garage sale for five bucks, ten bucks, I'll probably pick it up. Now, it's way too much right now online because he's a presidential nominee and they, they're trying to sell his game. I'd say it's worth five or ten. Um, it does have a, a broken rule uh, that doesn't make any sense, but we, it's, there's a quick fix that they have online, or we have a quick fix too to ease, easily fix the game, and it worked well uh, the second time we played it through, and we, we enjoyed it just as much, if not more. So, amazingly enough, the man made a good board game. Uh, whether you're going to vote for him or not, you can take that into consideration. Actually, I think they made a board game for Hillary, too. Nah, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, I, I vote independent every year, so what do I know? But I had to throw it in there. Anyway, so that was my number four. My number three was a game that I could never get a hold of in the board game library. I mean, this game stayed rented out from morning to late in the evening or, or early morning the next day. I never found it. I found it on the table. Everyone else was playing it. When once they'd return it, someone else would grab it. Uh, it was really a hot game in the board game library. I did get to go on the floor and test play it, you know, just test play around, and I loved it. So that's why it made the list. Still, it's called Stockpile. Really fun game where you're working the stock market. You're trying to buy and sell stock. You're trying to sell it before it goes broke. Buy it before the stock splits and makes you even more money. To do this, each player has some insider information. They know what one of the stocks are going to do, whether they're going up or down. Then you lay a bunch of stock out. Some of it's hidden, some of it's good. And you bid on what pile you want, gather those stocks, make your moves, and then reveal your cards to see the final result. And you keep going until someone, you know, I guess breaks it big. Uh, like I said, I never played the full version of this, which is why I'm not going to buy it. But I'll be honest, by, by just demoing it for a couple of rounds, I loved it. I thought it was a great game. I thought it was wonderful. Uh, it did have an expansion that had just come out that was there. Uh, the expansion looked a little confusing to me. Of course, he didn't really go over it in too much detail, too. But I'll be honest, stockpile something I'll be looking forward to if I ever go again or someone else buys it, I'll definitely play it. I want to play it through, though, to make sure I like it. But it looked like a really fun game. Good enough to make it in the top five, right? You're thinking, Matt, did you play any games? Yeah, I played several games. A ton of games did not impress me. But this one did. So that was Stockpile. My number three. My number two was a out-of-print board game that I eventually just went online and bought, I mean, immediately after we played it. And it was a game I'd been looking at uh, earlier this year. I was looking for a gangster game. You know, I wanted a game about gangsters, you know, and mobsters and whatnot. Now, there are several games out there that, you know, have the mob gangster theme. But this one, to me, when I looked up online, it looked like it had it the most. It captured the most. It had me interested. The pieces looked good. The gameplay sounded interesting. I was like, ooh, I want this game. And then I looked up reviews, and reviews on it were horrible. Uh, they talked about how broken it was, how cheap some of the features were on it. Uh, like the money, which they were correct. The money is like paper, cheap, and it's not colored, and it's hard to determine. It's like someone ran it off a Xerox copy machine from the 90s. Um, but even with all of that, uh, I loved Blood Feud in New York by Eagle Games. Uh, in Blood Feud, you are a boss. You're trying to take over. You're one of six families. You have to take over the entire New York. You have limos, boats, helicopters with moving propellers, skyscrapers, other buildings, uh, illegal precinct. You can pay off precincts uh, so that no one else can go through that you know, square. You have thugs, mercenaries, hitmen, and a whole lot of fun. Uh, this game is incredibly fun. For those who don't, you don't know what the rules are, I will sum it up in just one sentence. It is almost Conquest of the Empire. In fact, it is. 
It's conquest of the empire with uh, gangsters. That's all it is. I love me some conquest of the empire. And when I was reading the rules, I realized this is just conquest of the empire with a few different rules uh, with gangsters. Loved it. Loved it. Knew it was going to go in my collection. Is it broken? There are some broken uh, aspects of the game that are easily fixed. In fact, uh, I went, like I said, I bought it online. It's going to come in later on this week. I'm going to work on uh, doing a few things, drawing a few things up. Uh, you really don't need money in the game, probably just tokens. Uh, you need a better way to keep score, which I know of a way. Conquest of the Empire has a great uh, method to keep score. I'm going to do that for this game. Uh, with a few tweaks, we can make uh, what's a you know not very good game uh, one of the best games you'll ever play. And I truly believe it'll be one of the one of my favorite games once I once I do a few twe rule tweaks to it. And my board game group is going to eat it up because it is a super fun game. That's Blood Feud in New York, my number two game that I play. All right, folks, finally it's time to talk about my number one board game I played at Gen Con. And folks, this one went under the radar. Not just mine, but everyone's radar. When people talked about most anticipated games at Gen Con, I was listening. I made notes. I played 60% mm, of those games that were on people's lists, especially the ones when they when they said they cross-referenced, you know, like Seafall. Everyone has Seafall. Cry Havoc, blah, blah, blah. So I played a bunch of those. Um, and they were okay. Some not as good as I thought. Some were just not for me or not for my board game group. There was one game I played. It was on no one's list. No one's list for most anticipated game. And so I played it, and my eyes were opened, and my mouth had hit the floor. And I was like, this is the most incredible game I've played at Gen Con. And it turned out to be the best game I'd ever played at Gen Con. And it turns out to be, it's probably one of my favorite games of all time. That's right. If I did a top 10, oh, heck, top 5, I think this game would be in it. You're thinking, whoa, Matt, what is this? So I can get it. Well, you can't. You could only get it at Gen Con. It's not coming out to the end of this year or beginning of next year. And if I would have known that, I'd have bought it. But it was called Project Elite. This is a dice rolling game that happens in real time, meaning you're hitting a two minute timer, you're rolling dice, aliens are moving, you're moving, aliens attack you, you attack them. So much is going on in this game. You're trying to, over eight rounds, you're trying to complete objectives and retreat back to your base or just complete the objective and not let any aliens enter your base. Unbelievable game. I played it Friday right before they shut off the lights. I mean, like, they had announced it was closing. The guy said, I'm going to do a quick game for you. He did. We stayed late. They were really nice to keep us late. And I'm serious. Once we got up, they shut the lights off in the building. Uh, so I couldn't buy it that day. I said, you know what? No one's talking about this game. I don't want to go on the floor on Saturday. I'll just come back on Sunday and get it. That was a rookie mistake. I should not have done that. Everyone was into this game. It sold out. I was even his uh, demo copy sold out. Um, and so I just sat there at an empty table, you know, trying to hold back tears, knowing that I had the chance to buy this game with all the expansions, because I would buy all the expansions with this game, and I didn't. I didn't. I spent fifteen dollars at Gen Con, folks. $15. That was for too many expansions to a card game I have. That was it. $15 was my total. It should have been way more than that. And Project Elite should have been the game to make me open up my wallet. I, I, I guess I just thought, I couldn't do it Friday because they were already closed up. And I guess I just thought, I'm not going to fight the crowd on Saturday. Screw that. No one's talking about this game at Gen Con. Dumb, dumb move. In fact, everyone will tell you one of the one of the things you don't do is that when you find a game you really want, you buy it that day. You do not wait till Sunday. I even knew that, but for some reason, I thought, you know what? No one's talking about this game, folks. This is going to be a huge game. I think when it finally hits the U.S., it's not in the U.S. right now. 
and it won't be for some time because he's still trying to set up deals with the distributors, which is a bad sign, uh, meaning it may be first of next year. But either way, when it comes out with all expansions, sold, sold, a million times sold. I can't wait to get this game. I, I dream about this game at night still. I loved Project Elite. It was my number one game. I don't even like dice chucking games. All you're doing is throwing up the dice, rolling it back, picking it up, throwing it again. Boom, 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 boom. Just rolling them bones all day long. And I, how many dice games do I have? One? I own one dice chucking game. I mean, that's how much I don't really like dice chucking. And it just took me by storm. It took me by surprise. I was like, what is this game? I've got to own it. So I can't buy it overseas. Shipping would kill me, he said, which I kind of agree. But at the same time, if I'm waiting too long and it's available overseas, we may just have to bite the bullet because I'll be honest, it was one of the best games I have ever played. So that was my number one game. Folks, when this game ever comes out to the U.S., buy it. Buy it immediately. It's a fantastic game. All right, folks, that is my Gen Con overview. Hey, what was I wrong on? What did I miss? What did you enjoy about Gen Con? Let me know in the comments, and I will see you next time.